Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this presentation in the Toxicology and Societies, the Impacts of Chemicals in Our Lives speaker series. I'm Ruth Sofield, and I'm an Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry Professor at Western Washington University. My co-host, who's often here with us, is not here today, but that's Tracy Collier, and he sends his regrets. We would like to begin by acknowledging that we at Western Washington University are on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples who have lived in the Salish Sea Basin throughout the San Juan Islands and the North Cascade watershed from time immemorial. Please join us in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors, the Lummi Nation and Nooksack tribe for their enduring care and protection of our shared lands and waterways. And now, I'd like to go over a, few, over a few logistics. We will save questions for the end of the presentation, but you can use your Q&A feature on your screen at any time. You will be muted throughout the presentation, so we will use that feature to interact. The focus of our speaker series is to provide understandable examples of how events with a toxicological component have consequences to people and societies. We are happy to welcome Jessica Koski today. Jessica is a tribal member from the q and Kiwana Bay Indian community, located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. She has extensive experience thinking and working on indigenous rights. She's currently the branch chief, program manager, and regional fish and wildlife biologist for the U.S. Department of the Indian Bureau of Indian Affairs Midwest region, and will soon be joining us on the West Coast as she will be starting a doctoral program at the University of British Columbia, where she will continue her scholarship on indigenous rights impl implementation, challenges, and opportunities in Canada and the U.S. in the context of resource struggles. Today, Jessica will focus on the Great Lakes region of, the, of North America and will highlight indigenous toxic concerns in the context of indigenous uh, environmental justice and the roles indi indigenous communities are leading to protect the largest freshwater system in the world. Thank you, Jessica, for being here today. Thank you. Um, so, Gawin, Nita, Anishinaabe Moen, Anishinaabe Kwe, Naganigo Kwe, Ijenakaz, Ziguan Kwe, Ijenakaz, Nagagan Dodem, Wikwe Dong, and Junchpa. Um, so, thank you for the introduction, Ruth. Um, so, um, I'm a member of the Kiwana Bay Indian community. Um, I, I don't speak Anishinaabe Moen well, and so that's how I started off my talk. Um, with that um, humility of not knowing all of my language, um, but grateful that um, I am able to introduce myself um, in the traditional way. Um, this opening slide is a picture of Sand Point um, from the shores, um, my home shores, my homelands in Keweenaw Bay, located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Um, and this is a site that is um, really culturally important to my community. It is where um, we have our um, annual, a very a large annual traditional powwow. Um, we have our cultural resources center um, for, for tr traditional healing. Um, we have wild rice beds. We recreate there, we camp there. Um, and we also have um, uh, ancestors buried there as well. And it is also impacted by legacy cops, um, copper stamp sand um, that was dumped into Lake Superior from a mill just four miles north. Um, so, you know, even, you know, within my community, we're directly impacted from um, some of the legacies, the legacy of the copper mining boom in, in Michigan. Um, I first got started in, in finding my calling to the environmental field um, with five words. Um, and those five words were acid, mine drainage, and Lake Superior. And I'll touch on some of these issues in my talk today. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to cover today is um, an introduction to indigenous environmental justice, um, which is an emerging um, discourse led by indigenous scholars. And I'm also going to provide an overview of indigenous peoples and treaty rights in the Great Lakes region. And 
um, much of my presentation is going to focus on highlighting um, a lot of the key toxic issues and concerns for Indigenous communities throughout the Great Lakes region. Um, and this includes uh, sulfate impaired wild rice waters, legacy and new um, mining proposals throughout the region, nuclear and petrochemical industry impacts on First Nations in Ontario, um, and Great Lakes binational area of concerns and Superfund sites at um, Aquasasini in New York, um, concerns with tar sands pipelines and the Kalamazoo River oil spill, and atmospheric surface exchangeable pollutants, ASEPs, and chemicals of emerging concern. Um, and we've throughout this there, you'll get a glimpse into the role um, and concerns that tribes have and the actions that they're taking in many different ways to address these issues. Um, and also myself, I'm really um, defying any one role um, and I'm not speaking on behalf of my the agency that I currently work for. Um, I, I'm primarily speaking as a tribal member, um, as an aspiring indigenous scholar, um, but also drawing on my experiences um, in a lot of different ways. And so a lot of the issues um, that I'm going to be covering, you know, weave in and out of my experience as a tribal member, um, as, you know, a local community organizer activist, um, as a researcher traveling throughout the region, um, getting to know some of these issues more, um, more deeply. Um, and also currently as a federal program manager. And so in a lot of these ways, I am helping to support to build tribal capacity um, and research and restoration um, for some of the things that I'm going to talk about. And then at the end, um, I just have a few um, initial reflections on kind of bringing it all together um, under an indigenous environmental justice uh, lens. Um, that might be helpful for um, thinking about toxic issues, um, especially um, when they involve Indigenous communities. Next slide, please. So um, Indigenous environmental justice is unique and distinct from general concepts and theories of environmental justice, which are primarily concerned about disproportionate environmental harms and really focus on the responsibility um, being of social institutions. And so um, the concept of indigenous environmental justice has been arising um, out of the movement itself um, through people like Tom Goldtooth um, and the Indigenous Environmental Network um, and also indigenous scholars um, especially Deborah McGregor out of York University, um, Kyle Powell's White, and Dina Gilio Whitaker, and others. Um, so I'll refer to it as IEG, IEJ. So IEJ um, is re more responsive to Indigenous people's needs. Um, it's not purely from an environmental racism perspective. Um, we have very different histories and relationships with the land and also political relationships with the state. Um, and so that wasn't really recognized in the initial um, ideas of environmental justice. Um, Kyle Powell's White is also at the forefront of reframing environmental justice um in this the larger context of the, the larger environmental injustice of settler colonialism um where one society systematically interferes with another society's ability to experience vital social ecological relations and responsibilities next slide please Um, so IEJ, it offers um, anti-colonial insights into very deep-rooted sources of ecological crises. Um, so it can be really valuable in that regard. Um, and Deborah McGregor also um, frames Indigenous environmental justice really 
um, really grounded in, you know, how do our own um, traditional philosophies and worldviews um, perceive justice. So we have our own um, knowledge systems that have um, conceptions of justice. And so um, it's not creating anything new, it's not really emerging, but it's really just um, recovering um, revitalizing our traditional systems. Um, IEJ recognizes the importance of indigenous knowledge systems um, for transformative changes in that regard. And it asserts that a just and sustainable future must consider all relations. So it extends beyond the human dimension. Next slide, please. Um, so IEJ, um, as I mentioned, it, um, it recognizes indigenous knowledge, knowledge systems um, and also customary laws that, um, you know, we have principles that are thousands of years old and beyond that um, teach us how to live a good life and how to um, live in harmony with um, our other relations and also interconnected responsibilities, um, not only to other humans, but to our non-human relatives and to ecosystems and also to future generations. And so from an indigenous perspective, um, and I can really only speak from what I know um, from the Anishinaabe worldview, um, but there is a lot of similarities across indigenous cultures in this regard. Um, but this sense of responsibility that's intergenerational to our ancestors and to the ones yet to be born. Um, and my future research is going to explore um, the implementation of the international principles of indigenous rights as an instrumental and transformative tool for supporting IEJ. Um, and the reason why I think this is so instrumental is that um, if dominant um, nation states cannot recognize and implement um, the foundational um, principles for indigenous peoples as human beings to live um, a dignified, self-determined life, um, how are we going to ever get to the place of also extending um, those rights and um, protecting um, our more than human relatives. Um, and so I really feel like that's like a foundational bridge to get to these larger goals for indigenous environmental justice. Next slide, please. So the indigenous peoples of the Great Lakes region, um, there's there's no really good map that exists out there um, to um, really capture it, I think, accurately. And it's always, it has been changing through time. Um, but um, there are more than 100 tribal and First Nation communities with diverse cultures um, that have called the Great Lakes home for thousands of years. The indigenous peoples of the Great Lakes are the original caretakers of these lands and waters and continue to lead protection and restoration efforts um, for the Great Lakes and its interconnected ecosystems. And despite severe disruption by historical and ongoing um, colonial forces and capitalism, our traditional knowledge, legal and governance systems still do exist. Next slide, please. Um, so unique in the Great Lakes region and also the Pacific Northwest, um, well, not unique um, specifically in regards to treaty rights, there are, there are treaties made between indigenous nations and the nation states of the US and Canada um, since at least the 1700s. Um, but unique to the Great Lakes region and Pacific Northwest are um, specifically rights that reserve that tribes reserved to hunt, fish, and gather on ceded territory. And this picture I have here is a pictograph 
It's a symbolic petition of Chippewa chiefs um, represented by their clan symbols. And the lines are showing um, their hearts and minds connected to one another and connected to their beloved homelands. And the Ojibwe chiefs brought this symbolic petition on birch bark um, to Washington to petition um, to be able to stay and remain um, and have permanent residence in their homelands because there was word that um, we were going to get marched west. And this actually was successful, um, this delegation in securing um, our permanent reservations that we have today. And so this led to the establishment of the Treaty of 1854, um, which included um, my reservation for the Keweenaw Bay Indian community as well as many other tribes. Um, so treaties are also um, recognized as the supreme law of the land in the United States Constitution, um, just as um, the United States would sign a treaty with France. Um, these were um, these are in that same category within our Constitution, although um, oftentimes tribes have to um, litigate and get these rights affirmed um, for them to actually be upheld. Um, so it's been a constant struggle. However, um, albeit um, largely untested, the, the treaties of the Great Lakes region um, are potentially a significant legal tool for protecting the Great Lakes. Next slide, please. So Minoman, wild rice, um, is a very sacred and culturally significant uh, plant species that um, is prevalent throughout the Great Lakes region. Um, for the Anishinaabe, um, this was our prophesized homeland. We were originally on the eastern seaboard of North America and um, followed a series of prophecies um, to migrate to the place where food grows on the water, um, which is the wild rice. And um, annual harvest events for wild rice is very important throughout the region. Um, it's a reserve tree right as well for many tribes. It's a highly nutritious and important um, subsistence food. It is socially and culturally important. It's used in um, all of our ceremonies. Um, and it is also really important for um, many ecological re reasons for water quality and for other wildlife. And good water quality and habitat are essential for Minoman to survive. Next slide, please. Um, so this picture here is um, from the very first um, NOAA, the no National Oceanic and um, Atmospheric Administration and Tribal Lake Superior Minoman Restoration Workshop, which was held in Odana, Wisconsin on the Bad River Reservation in 2016. Um, and this was also um, part of my role in connecting um, NOAA and tribal communities that were involved for the planning um, of this workshop. And there have been, I think, three or four workshops since then, um, and it's expanding to the other Great Lakes as well. And so at the very opening of that workshop, um, everybody wrote what Minoman is to them. Um, and so that um, this image is um, symbolic of, of the importance of Minoman. And some of the key themes are ecosystem health, tradition and family, food, nutrition for people and for wildlife. Next slide, please. So toxic threats to Minoman um, are especially a concern in Minnesota, um, where there are many waterways that are affected um, by taconite mine pits and processing facilities, tailings, basins, and pits, waste rock piles, and also coal-fired power plants and ethanol plants. Um, and this sulfate pollution, um, when it's in the water and it converts to sulfide, 
in the plant root zone. And then it's toxic also to the wild rice seedling. And so you can see a picture there um, of the effect of iron sulfide on the wild rice root. And so this is even at very low levels. Um, sulfate can um, be the lead cause of wild rice loss. And in addition to the sulfate pollution affecting wild rice waters, it also increases methylmercury contamination in fish. Um, the state of Minnesota has a 10 milligram per liter sulfate standard um, that was put in place to protect wild rice, which is also the state grain of Minnesota. Um, but for many, many years, it was never enforced. Next slide, please. For here, tribes, um, as well as environmental groups have pushed for enforcement of Minnesota's sulfate limit for wild rice waters. And just recently, last month, the Environmental Protection Agency finally enforced the Clean Water Act and directed the state to list 30 waters that are impaired for wild rice, um, which will then um, direct um, plans and cleanup for those waters. Um, tribes themselves also have um, water, their own water quality standards um, pursuant to the Clean Water Act. Um, in, in Minnesota, this includes Fond du Lac and Grand Portage, and they have um, that same 10 milligrams per liter of sulfate limit, um, which studies show is um, the necessary standard in order to protect wild rice. There are new toxic discharges proposed in the region um, from a proposed polymet copper nickel sulfide mine that would greatly, in greatly increase the levels of sulfate in wild rice waters. Um, and this is a concern um, and it would require active treatment of pollution for hundreds of years if this project were supported. Um, this picture here is of Nancy Schultz. She's a water projects coordinator for the Fond du Lac Band um, and just a really instrumental tribal environmental professional, um, both locally and regionally. And she also serves nationally um, on tribal water issues. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a map of that was produced by the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, highlighting mines and mineral um, activity throughout the Lake Superior Basin, just um, to get a glimpse of the extensiveness of um, that activity in the region. And this is what my previous role working for my tribe focused on as a mining technical assistant. Um, this um, can't, I don't have a pointer to point on it, but if you can tell on the bottom, um, there's a big peninsula that shoots out into Lake Superior that's in green and it's got a circle around it. Yep, right there. Um, so that's the Keweenaw Peninsula and that circle there is um, highlighting the Torch Lake area of concern, which is on the next slide, which you can go to. Um, so in my opening, I had mentioned just briefly um, on copper mining and the impacts on my community. Um, so similar to, you may be familiar with the California gold rush, um, there was a similar rush for copper in the Keweenaw Peninsula. And one of the primary dump sites um, was the Torch, Torch Lake. And Torch Lake gets its name as um, it was traditionally a place where my people would go to um, spear walleye and we would have torches. And so that's where it gets its name from. Um, and I believe it was in the 70s. Um, there was documentation of fish deformities in the lake. Um, and it was designated as a Superfund site and also a binational area of concern. And those um, designations are basically the most toxic hotspots that are in the Great Lakes that are of concern to both um, Canada and the Great Lakes pursuant to um, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and um, binational agreements. Um, so, and my tribe is also actively involved um, in participating in um, remediation for these activities or for restoration of the lake. 
Next slide, please. So this, this video is gonna give you a little introduction to this history, probably much better than I can. And it's just a really nice visual. So um, we're gonna transition into Buffalo Reef, which um, the stamp sand mining waste from the copper mining era was dumped not only to Torch Lake, but also directly into Lake Superior. And this was back before we had things like the Clean Water Act. Um, and so you can see here, um, this bottom right picture is stamp sands that you can see as an aerial view um, in Lake Superior. Um, it is just an extensive amount of stamp sand. Um, and there's a very critical reef um, to my tribe, especially um, that is threatened by um, encroaching stamp sands. And so this is an effort that I've been involved in um, in my different roles and that I've actually been able to be much more um, influential on in my current role um, with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and being able to make connections, um, get the Army Corps of Engineers and the Environmental Protection Agency and the tribe and the researchers at Michigan Tech um, all connected um, and helping to elevate this as a priority under the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, so currently there's a task force made up of tribal, state and federal um, leads that are working on long-term um, cleanup planning for this, um, as it is one of the, probably one of the largest um, environmental issues facing the Great Lakes. Okay, so you can go ahead and play this for, we're only gonna listen to three minutes of this video. This is described as where the copper grew on the mountain. It's my understanding that it's the only place in the world where copper was like that, where it could be mined on the surface. We have stories within our community that we as a people use copper. And we traded copper up and down the Mississippi for other goods. So it was part of our lives. There was this mass copper that you could find at that time sticking out from the shoreline and from deposits along the mid-rib of the Keweenaw Peninsula. On the Keweenaw Peninsula, which juts into Lake Superior, is located the most important deposit of native copper ever found. It wasn't until 1842 that it was a copper land rush. Everybody ran into here to set up claims to try and find copper and to begin exploration. In total, around 140 mines were set up. They discovered that they could actually consistently get more copper out by pounding, smashing the basalt, and that's why we call them stamp sands. The copper was only one to two percent of the rock, so 97 percent of what came out were these stamp sands. We know that they discharged 22.7 million metric tons of stamp sands. If you were loading up railroad cars, they would stretch all the way to San Diego. They went till 1932, so they were adding stuff on the pile, but we have strong currents that move southward in the bay. It wasn't until later on that the stamp sands made it all the way down to the Traverse River. Pieces were starting to arrive in the 50s and 60s. By the early 80s, the original string beach was covered by stamp sands. Um, okay, so next slide. 
So in addition to legacy mining impacts, um, my tribe is also involved in um, new mining. And for a number of years, I was involved in a lot of the technical um, review and comment and coalition building and advocacy to protect Lake Superior and also a culturally significant um, sacred place, Megizi Wasson Eagle Rock, um, which is in the bottom photo, um, which is the Eagle Mine site. Um, there's a patch there in the back um, and that's Eagle Rock. Um, the top left photo is um, I believe the Salmon Trout River on the Yellow Dog Plains. Um, the Eagle Mine is a sulfide mine, copper mine, um, that um, is a sulfide mine because um, the, the copper and the other precious metals are um, embodied within this um, sulfur. And when that is, also, that is exposed to air and water, um, it can create acid mine drainage. And I'll touch on that briefly on the next slide. Um, so my tribe was really deeply concerned with this. This is a place where we also um, hunt and gather um, wild blueberries. And there's concern also with um, toxicity from um, venting from the sulfide mine um, and impacts to air quality. And there are other studies in other locations that have showed um, that um, the blueberry um, can take up those sort of those toxins. Um, and this other picture here is my community at the Michigan Court of Appeals. Um, we worked um, for a very long time within um, existing state legal structures to try to um, have our concerns heard um, and our sacred place protected and the water protected. Um, we were unsuccessful through that process. Um, through my work though, we, do we did successfully stop a mining hall road that would connect the, the Eagle Mine to the Humboldt Mill where they are currently trucking still um, through existing roads. Um, but we did save pristine wetlands um, from opening up to for a mining hall road, um, which would also open up to additional exploration. Next slide, please. Um, so just briefly, um, acid mine drainage is, um, an irreversible concern. Um, and so sulfide mining in the Great Lakes is, is a big concern for tribes for this reason. And we really take seriously our responsibility to protect the water. Um, cleaning up of these problems already within the United States exceeds $70 billion. Um, and um, 12,000 streams have already been polluted with acid mine drainage. Next slide, please. Um, another um, current a big issue in the Great Lakes is a proposed sulfide mine along the Menominee River, which is the border of um, Michigan and Wisconsin. It's on the, the Minnesota side, and so it's being permitted by the state of Michigan um, or going through the permit processes through the state of Michigan. The Menominee tribe, um, for them, they are deeply concerned with this project. The Menominee River is the origin of their creation story. So unlike the Anishinaabe who migrated to the Great Lakes, the Menominee here have been here. This is their origin. Um, they take seriously their responsibility for protecting sturgeon in the river, wild rice, um, the water. It's their sacred home. It's their origin. They have ancestral remains that are in the footprint and the proximity of the proposed mine. And unlike the Eagle Mine, that is an underground mine, which at least there's um, somewhat of a um, lesser concern for the oxidation and um, the mixture of um, air and water to create the acid mine drainage. Um, although there's certainly huge significant risks there still too, um, this would be an open pit mine. And so the risks, the risks are even um, greater in that regard. They have had some recent victories, though, um, with permit applications. Um, on April 23rd, a Michigan Circuit Court judge ordered um, a reconsidered decision for an initial mining permit to Aquila Resources, that 40 project. 
Next slide, please. Um, and so there's many other proposals um, and there's been successful tribal resistance. Um, some of them that stand out, um, there was on the Bad River Reservation, um, Indigenous peoples and their allies prevented trains carrying sulfuric acid to a former white pine mine that would have injected acid into the mine in order to extract remaining um, copper and other metals. Um, the Bad River Band was successful in um, at least holding, having a, a Gogebic Technite hold on a proposal right upstream from the best um, and most um, productive wild rice beds in the Great Lakes and their reservation on the Bad River Reservation. The Mole Lake, um, Sokoli and Chippewa community were, were successful in resisting the Crandon mine in Wisconsin and they actually purchased the mine site to permanently protect it. Um, and there's also the Polymet mine proposal I briefly mentioned in Minnesota, which is also a sulfide mine proposal. Um, and there is good news on that front recently, um, just about a week ago, the Minnesota Supreme Court blocked a critical permit for that mine as well. Next slide, please. Um, so the next two issues are a couple of First Nation um, environmental justice issues that I learned about when I was doing my master's research in the Great Lakes region, and they really stood out as some of the biggest, um, if not the biggest environmental justice issues I've ever come across. Um, and the first one is the nuclear industry impacts on the Serpent River First Nation. Um, there's a book there I have a picture of um, that tells the stories from the community titled, This is My Homeland. Um, there were 16 uranium mines that operated in the Serpent River watershed and it's still the largest source of radium discharge into the Great Lakes. Next slide, please. Um, the Amjanong First Nation, uh, they're surrounded by 62 petrochemical plants um, known as Chemical Valley. Um, and it counts for 40, about 40% 40 of Canada's petrochemical industry. Um, there have been a lot of studies. Um, some of them um, have shown, oh, there is one that had, has shown that there is um, outnumbered ratio uh, as well as um, harmful hormone blocking pollutants that um, are likely possibly the connection there um, where there's two to one ratio in the community with more baby girls than more baby boys being born. Um, and, and speaking with a community activist when I was doing my research um, in her own um, perspective, you know, once they when they did that research, she was um, it was like an epiphany because they also have um, they can see that in their community where you know they have um, more girls for um, the softball team than than boys. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Um, so this is just a short video um, just to conclude the Amjanang First Nation story. Share a lens for you to look through. Um, it's a, a harsh reality that uh, Amjanong community members um, have to face. Um, I was sitting at a table um, with community members and then it hit me like a ton of bricks that every single person that was sitting at that table with me had lost their spouse, um, their child, um, a family member to cancer um, and that is a real life thing for Om Janong. It's, uh, it's our reality. Um, even more so when it does come time to say Ba Mom P means I'll see you again to our loved ones and we bring them to our burial grounds. If you, if you look around, see this behind me. It's surrounding us, around our cemetery. So perhaps the very thing that had caused someone to leave us too soon, um, it's a reminder for the rest of the family when they are saying their bum on peas. 
So I just wanted to share that lens uh, to see through. And so you can perhaps gain a better understanding of what environmental racism looks like um, and what the people here at Amjanong First Nation have to face. All right, next slide. Um, so I'm gonna kind of breeze through here so that we have um, enough time to get through any Q and A. So the, one of the tribes that I work with in my current role is the St. Regis Mohawk tribe. Um, and they are the first and only tribe to serve as a co-lead for one of the binational areas of concern on their um, reserve. Um, and they're actively working to also integrate traditional ecological knowledge into the priority setting process. Um, next slide, please. And they're also actively involved in um, remediation for three Superfund sites. Um, and if anybody is interested in learning more about this, um, when we do the handouts after the meeting, I'll provide my contact information. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think we'll have time to um, share this video, um, but um, it's a really beautiful video. You can Google it um, through the Gun Lake Tribe, the Machi Binashiwish Tribe. But if you search Gun Lake Tribe, um, the river, let me see what it's called. The river tells it. Um, so I encourage you to check that out if you're interested. Um, there's a lot of pipeline concerns um, for tar sands. Well, the tar sands issue itself is an indigenous environmental justice issue up in Canada. Um, but the, the transport of that through the Great Lakes is a concern. Um, the top picture there is um, from a, a community gathering rally um, at a drill pad site by the Mississippi River um, for line three, which is getting um, constructed um, as we speak and that indigenous communities and many allies are um, trying to prevent and there's a lot of litigation going on as well, but at the same time that it's in court, um, it's still being built um, through treaty territory and wild rice beds. Um, there's line five, which is a concern. Um, and this bottom picture is, shows one of the models that was produced out of the University of Michigan's Water Center of what the different scenarios could be for a spill at the Straits of Mackinac with um, two outdated um, twin pipelines on the lake bottom. Um, and then of course the Kalamazoo River oil spill, um, which impacted um, indigenous communities, um, especially the Gun Lake tribe and the Nadwa Sepi Huron Band of Potawatomi. Um, and it was the largest inland oil spill in US history. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, in addition to all of these local issues, there are global issues um, that are toxic concerns in the Great Lakes for tribes as well. Um, global, global atmospheric surface exchangeable pollutants. Um, in my community alone, more than 75% of tribal members report fish being a primary source of subsistence. 100% of the Great Lakes and connecting waterways have fish consumption advisories. Um, next slide. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip this slide. It's just showing the, the pathways in the process. Next slide, please. Um, and for indigenous communities, a lot of the, um, mainstream um, systems and models for exposure um, don't take into account the many different ways that indigenous communities, because of our culture and our connection to the land, um, I'll just state that there's a lot of other um, exposure pathways that um, a lot of quantitative methods for consumption advisories don't take into account. Um, next slide, please. Um, so my community's question is, when can we eat the fish? Um, because these fish consumption advisories were never meant to be permanent, they were meant to be temporary. Um, and eliminating these advisories is going to require coordination at regional, national, and international scales. Um, and so I have a link on there, um, if you are interested. 
um, Michigan Tech released um, also with the support of Northwest Indian College, a policy brief on what it would take to no longer need these advisories in the Great Lakes. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I won't cover all of this, but it's available online and this could be a follow-up item. Um, this is six points in that policy brief. Next slide, please. So there's also emerging contaminants. Um, there's an estimated 2000 new chemicals being introduced each year. Um, we don't know what the bioaccumulative effects and you know the, the synergistic effects of um, mixing these um, different chemicals and, and contaminants. Um, tribal communities are concerned about these, um, even though there's not a lot of knowledge on them. Um, as our communities rely heavily on fish and wildlife for subsistence and culture. And so there's a lot of safety concerns. Um, and next slide, please. Um, we are, through my current role, I'm um, supporting the Grand Portage Band um, with some research that they are doing collaboratively with other partners. Um, and they're finding pharmaceuticals and um, these chemicals are in remote locations that don't have any obvious source. Um, and so those are concerns and research that they're looking into. And there's um, new research that um, for a tire derived chemical that um, is a new project that they are going to be starting um, in collaboration across the state of Minnesota. Uh, next slide, please. So just to wrap up here, um, just some concluding reflections, tying it back to the indigenous environmental justice lens. Um, there's many examples of resource exploitation um, across the region, and this is rooted in, uh, is a pattern, and it's rooted in settler colonialism. And our communities are working tirelessly to protect their homelands and way of life, um, often you know, within systems that are not set up to protect our treaty rights and um, our indigenous rights and our responsibilities to our other not more than human relatives. Um, there are growing successful examples um, and tribes are not just victims. They are leading and directing research, coalition building, direct action and protection and restoration for the Great Lakes. Um, and indigenous conceptions of justice, um, they go beyond the human dimension and they include concern and responsibilities for um, wild rice, fish, wildlife, the sky, water, um, ancestors, and our future generations to come. And indigenous knowledge systems and philosophies can also offer transformational wisdom and principles in how to live a good life and in harmony. Um, and I can look to you know, my own Anishinaabe um, teachings, such as Minoba Mata's Win, um, which means good life. Um, we have our seven grandfathers teaching, um, which includes um, seven principles to live by, respect, wisdom, truth, love, bravery, honesty, humility, um, and also um, to understand, you know, even through our history, our teachings show that we have been resilient through change. Um, we've had, our, you know, um, even climate change related stories, and we have um, stories of even um, the times that we are in right now, um, but the, is what is known as uh, the seventh fire prophecy um, in which humanity will have a choice between two paths. And those are believed to be um, the path, one path that is a headlong rush to destruction that is thought to believe, be a path of materialism um, and technology, and then a slower greener path which is believed to be the path um, of spiritualism. And so with that, um, I will close and um, at least I left 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, so. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, so some of the, the video that we weren't able to see, we can definitely share that in our thank you to attendees. And um, so, so we'll share some resources. But I was um, just personally really, I guess, amazed by the all the contaminants you all are thinking about, but it's, it's, um, I mean, you have the list of everything, right? That's a concern for, for the people, uh, the 
tribal members and, and other people that live near the Great Lakes. Um, and these are big problems. These are hard. These are these are hard problems to solve. Um, we have we have time for a, a few questions, and I wanted to start with one from the audience, which is, "What are the most prevalent health concerns for tribe members on your land?" If you can speak to that for us, what do people think about? What do they worry about? What do they see? Yeah. Um, so, in terms of like, I don't see it so much as really the the human health. I really see from the indigenous perspective in my community, like the primary concern is often the water. Um, I mean, it's, it's all interconnected though too. Um, and I think there's a lot of curiosity too because there's just not really a lot of studies that link it either. You know, there's, my community has questions about what are the health effects of stamp sands on our reservation? Um, you know, and we know um, now not to, um, you know, have our, have our children, you know, do hand to mouth and, you know, when we go to the beach on our own reservation. Um, so there are um, concerns, but I think it, it's really just this bigger picture. It's not just the human health, it's the health of the environment too. Okay. Which those are hard connections to make, but, but I'm glad that you all are thinking about it. Um, and just so you know, I think about that a lot too. And I had, don't have answers, but that's in part what inspired this series was to try to think kind of beyond just what happens to a human, but also what's happening to cultures and um, and ecosystems and 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 just everything how we're so interrelated. So your your presentation is really um, kind of tapping into those things that I'm always thinking about about, but I, I don't have answers for. So um, okay, so there are some questions about. Um, this is a, this is a longish longish one, but I think there's and there's a few questions. In, well, there's there's some comments in it, but I think I'll ask it this way. Um, how do we bring tribal treaty rights or an other indigenous rights closer to the center of decision making? And they see two problems, and and I'll give them to you so you can either build from them or or discuss them. Um, so one is that sometimes agencies, permittees, and communities aren't sure about where or how an indigenous right constrains possible decisions. And then two, even when rights are clear, when push comes to shove, they are often ignored or at least given secondary status compared to various federal, state, and local laws and regulations. So how do you how do we bring tribal treaty rights and uh, other indigenous rights closer to the center of decision making? in your mind yeah I really I think it takes um, some like higher level structural um, commitment and implementation um, nationwide too um, but it doesn't have to wait for that either you know like British Columbia is the first province um, that has adopted a law to a legislation to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, I don't know if it's um, really gone far enough yet, or it's I think it's taking a while for them to have an action plan still. Um, but you know, states can begin um, at state and um, national levels begin to um, implement these. Um, in the United States, um, there's with the current administration, there is a very robust tri tribal policy, um, but I'm not seeing. Um, this broader um, recognition of um, an implementation of the UN Declaration. And a lot of it, it also has to do with um, the foundation for dom the domestic um, tribal and national relationship and um, the initial foundation for Native American law, which is really um, justified and grounded on outdated um, international common law of the discovery doctrine. Um, and that was, that's really the foundation. And so I feel like, you know, now we have um, completely new norms internationally for, with respect to indigenous peoples. Um, and so it really is gonna require, I, I think really transformative changes and decolonization and just really structurally, um, it's gonna be a lot of work, um, but I think, um, Either there's always opportunities for um, for asserting and, and pushing the boundaries at different levels. 
Okay. I think one final question, and um, this one is just kind of related to the question from the audience member is about the acid mine drainage and a question as to whether there's any solutions being considered to prevent new problems from occurring. But um, and I believe it's with respect to the acid mine drainage. Um, but I'm just kind of thinking, what's the role that that the tribes play in the decision making around cleaning up or treating these contaminated sites? How what does that interaction look like and how successful is it? Um, so oftentimes, because we have outdated mining laws in the, the, the country, I think it's 1872, um, and so it's really at the state level, a lot of any mine per permitting, um, even one of the big issues in Michigan is um, the federal government has also delegated Clean Water Act authorities for wetland permitting, so in the case of the Eco Sulfide Mine, every single permit was through the state. Um, so that meant there was no National Environmental Policy Act NEPA process. So we were at the mercy of the state, which we did not sign treaties with the state. And so there was just um, a complete loophole for our treaty rights. Um, but the tribes are involved in many different ways. Um, and in my previous role, um, at every table we could get to, um, to try to um, influence um, decision making, educating the community, um, consultation um, where, where it was possible. Um, tribes also can set their own water quality standards um, for if there's mines upstream. Um, so more and more tribes are getting um, their own water quality standards. And then in that case, then it does trigger EPA enforcement of the Clean Water Act um, for anything even off the reservation if it's gonna impact on reservation waters. Um, there's lots and lots of different ways that, that tribes are involved. Okay, great. Well, I wanted to thank you, Jessica, for being a voice and for sharing your experience and knowledge with us. And I do look forward to meeting you when you come to the West Coast. You're not that far from us and I, I look forward to that. And so thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, we have two more presentations in the series and they're both on the perfluorinated chemicals or PFOS, the forever chemical. And so uh, in two weeks, we'll have a presentation on the challenges of treating PFOS, the forever chemical. So thank you all for joining us and we will see you in two weeks.